Okay, let's get to Isaiah 53. We're going to walk through Isaiah 53 over the next several weeks. We're going to break it down section by section, but I wanted to do this chapter with this tool that we have, which we did John 3. I don't know if you guys were in here when we did John 3, but go ahead and uh, grab Isaiah 53. Um, let's go through a couple of things before um, we tackle the, the, the and read through the entire chapter today. Today we're going to spend the, a day doing an overview of the book of Isaiah, and the, specifically this chapter. This book was written 700 years before Jesus was born, before he taught, before he was arrested, before he was crucified, put in the grave, resurrected, and descended and ascended into heaven. 700 years before Jesus was on the cross, Isaiah writes this. And it's almost as if Isaiah was sitting down at the foot of the cross and just taking notes as to what he was witnessing. It is a clear prophecy of Christ, and even more specific, a clear prophecy of his death, burial, and resurrection. All right? 700 years, guys, before it actually happened. And this gives us confidence, this gives us assurance that the author of the Bible is the Spirit of God. It's not men coming up with these stories. You cannot, man cannot stitch together the truths, the stories that we find in the Bible over thousands of years and have it tell one cohesive, very clear story. The entire Bible is about one, Jesus. He is the focus of the Bible, not you, not me, it's Christ, and we see Christ in this chapter. Again, convincing proof that God is the author of the Scriptures. Isaiah giving painstaking detail of this prophecy of the coming Messiah, and what's going to happen to him when he comes. The Jews um, were expecting the Messiah to come. They were not expecting him to suffer and be killed. But Isaiah says it. They just missed it. Okay? So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at um, the structure. Uh, we're going to look at the New Testament connections to the book of Isaiah. How do the New Testament writers view this chapter? How does Christ view this chapter? Then we're going to see what does the Jew today think about Isaiah 53? Because remember, the Old Testament are the scriptures for the Jews. Mm -hmm. Jewish people believe the Old Testament is the word of God. They do not believe that the New Testament is the word of God. Because they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. So the question is, if I'm standing up here and saying Isaiah 53 is about Jesus... What do they think Isaiah 53 is about? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how uh, the vantage point of Isaiah, how he writes it. And then we're going to talk about the theme that we see throughout this book, or throughout this chapter, is this, the theme is substitutionary atonement. We're going to talk about these today, kind of do an overview of the, the chapter. Next week, we'll get into the first couple of verses, okay? Charles Spurgeon said of this chapter... This is one of the chapters that lie at the very heart of the Scriptures. It is the very holy of holies of divine writing. Charles Spurgeon says that this is the core of the Gospel. So let's talk about structure. Isaiah 53 is broken down into five sections, each of which are made up of three verses, and each particular section brings forward an important truth about the coming Christ. Five sections, each section is three verses. Each section brings forward a clear truth about the coming Messiah that would come 700 years in the future from when Isaiah wrote this down, okay? Uh, the chapter and verse divisions were actually added later. So Isaiah didn't write, sit down and write chapter 53, verse 1. Chapter 53, verse 2. That's not all of those, the numbers in your Bible, that was all added later on to help people navigate their way through the scriptures. So 
this was actually, um, Isaiah 53 actually starts in Isaiah 52, verse 13, which we'll see here in a minute. So these chapter and verse additions were added in the 1500s when Bibles first be, were first mass produced and printed to help the common folk like myself know how to navigate the scriptures and get to specific places. Now since the last three verses of chapter 52 form the introduction to chapter 53, it is the first section. So let's look. So what we're looking at is the structure of this chapter. I said it's five sections. The first section is chapter 52, verse, verses 13 through 15. Now what we're going to see, the theme, remember I said each of these five sections has a main theme that it's going to bring forward about the coming Messiah, the coming servant. The theme of this first section, these three verses, is the exaltation of the servant. We're just going to read through each of these um, and over the next couple of weeks, we'll get, spend more time in each of this section. So next week, we'll, we'll dig into chapter 52, 13 through 15. That's what we'll spend our time doing. So part one is the first section, exaltation of the servant. Isaiah says, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. Here's the theme. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see and that which they have not heard they understand. Move on to the next section. This next section is 53, verses 1 through 3. We're going to see the humiliation of the servant. Verse 1. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Notice here, all of this, despised, rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. All of it speaks to the humiliation of the servant. We'll look at this section in two weeks. The next section is verses 4 through 6. We see the theme of the substitutionary atonement of the servant. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See the theme here. He was crushed for our, pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. All of this speaks to this idea of the substitutionary atonement. He steps into our place. We'll look at this in three weeks. The next section is verse 7, 8, and 9, and we see the submission of the servant, the one Isaiah is talking about. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, notice the submission, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent, he opened not his mouth. 
By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Last section. The theme here is the victory of the servant. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. So see his offspring, prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The will of the Lord shall prosper, victory, in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgression. So you see the victory of the servant in the idea of that the Lord's will will prosper, shall be satisfied, you divide a portion, think victory, the spoil, think victory. So you see the theme of the victory of the servant in the last three verses of Isaiah 53. Can you dig it? All right. Let's talk about the New Testament connections. Isaiah 53 uh, was shrouded in mystery until Jesus came, died, rose again. Remember, before Jesus was born, Isaiah 53 had been written for 700 years. Wasn't clear what it meant and who, who was he talking about it, or how exactly is this prophecy going to play out in history. So there was a mystery uh, that, that was uh, unknown until Jesus comes and fulfills everything um, that Isaiah put forward in the chapter. So the New Testament writers, remember Old Testament written here, if you're looking at this as a timeline of history, then the cross happens, and then the New Testament writers pick up their pens and start writing about what they witnessed and saw during Jesus' life, teachings, ministry, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension at the cross, okay? So the question that I'm asking is, what do the New Testament writers think about the Old Testament passage of Isaiah 53? That's the question that we're asking. What are the New Testament connections to this passage? This chapter, Isaiah 53, is quoted more than any other chapter uh, from the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the one chapter from the Old Testament that is quoted the most by the New Testament writers is this chapter. So it was important. They saw this chapter to me. This is important. We need to talk about this. Does that make sense? Where specifically? Okay, let's look at... Uh, two of them specifically, and uh, I'll mention just a couple of other ones. Jesus himself first drew the connection between himself and Isaiah's prophecy in Luke 22, where he's quoting Isaiah when he told his disciples in verse uh, 37 of Luke 22. This is Jesus speaking. He says, for I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled. And then he quotes Isaiah 53. And he was numbered with the transgressors. Then he says, For what is written about me has its fulfillment. Do you remember where it was said that he was um, numbered with the transgressors? <laughs> At the end of chapter 53, verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. So in Luke 22, 
Jesus says, hey, remember that passage in Isaiah 53, verse 12, where he said the servant of Yahweh will be num uh, numbered among the transgressors? Jesus says, that's me. In Luke 22, to his disciples. I am that. It was written about me, he says. In Acts 8, uh, we see that this, Isaiah 53, is the passage that the Ethiopian eunuch was reading when Philip comes to him in, in Acts 8. In Acts 8, verse 26, it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go to the Ethiopian eunuch as he was in his chariot. Verse 27, So what did Philip do? And Philip rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. So here's the picture. The Ethiopian eunuch's in his chariot, and he has the prophet Isaiah open, and he's reading it. And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, so Philip goes to the Ethiopian eunuch, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can't, the Ethiopian eunuch says, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him in the chariot. Now, the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Ethiopian eunuch was reading, Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shears was silent, so he opened not his mouth. Does that sound familiar? Isaiah 53, verse 7. And he was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that's before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So this is the passage that the Ethiopian eunuch was reading when the Spirit says to Philip, hey, hop into the chariot with this guy and help him understand. And then Philip goes, continues to tell the Ethiopian eunuch, hey, that's actually about Jesus. Let me tell you about Jesus of Nazareth, because that's who Isaiah was talking about. Okay? This passage, Isaiah 53, is also um, quoted... In Romans 10, Romans 15, John 12, Matthew 8, and 1 Peter 2. Warren Wearsby calls Isaiah 53. He's a good Bible teacher um, with the Lord now. He's passed away. Um, great Bible teacher. He says of this chapter that this is the Mount Everest of Messianic prophecy. Because like Mount Everest, Isaiah 53 stands out in beauty and grandeur because it reveals Jesus Christ and takes us to the foot of the cross on Mount Calvary 700 years before it actually happened. 700 years before it happened. Okay, now that we talked about the New Testament connections, let's talk about the Jewish interpretation. What we're asking is, if, I, if, I stay, if I'm saying Isaiah 53 is talking about Jesus, this is a Jewish book, Isaiah 53 is Jewish, but what do the Jews say? Because they don't believe it's talking about Jesus. What do the Jews say? So that's the question. So the Jews believed this passage did talk about the Messiah all the way up into the 1100s. So if you were to go into a synagogue before the 1100s, the, the priest there, the rabbi there, would, if they were in Isaiah 53, they would say, this is about the Messiah. In the 1100s, it switched. That teaching switched. Two, what they would say today is, no, Isaiah isn't talking about the servant. Isaiah is actually talking about the people, the Jewish people as a whole. They are the servant of Isaiah 53. That's what you would be taught if you were to go into a synagogue today, that Isaiah was not talking about the <laughs> Messiah. And the 1100s, the switch. No, Isaiah is talking about the Jewish people as a whole, is what they would say. So let me challenge that. By going back and, and reading um, the text itself and asking, is the, are they talking about, is Isaiah talking about people, plural, or a person, singular, right? Because in, the rabbis would say that this is talking about people, the Jewish people as a nation. The question is, 
Is it talking about people or a person, singular? You look at the text and he goes, but heard my servant, notice that that's singular. He, that's singular. At you, singular. So shall he, singular. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. What is that, plural or singular? Singular. Singular. So it seems like, number one, it's talking about a singular person. So let's set that argument aside and remember that. Okay, that gives me, that's one drop in the bucket that makes me think, okay, it's, it seems like it's talking about one person. Another way, way that I would say, okay, challenge the view that this is talking about the Jewish people as a whole is in verse 3. He talks about, uh, let me see here, let me change this. I want to erase this right here. In verse 3, yep, that's where I'm at. I'm here and I want to. Nope. Erase. There we go. There we go. There we go. And verse 3 is what we're looking at here. The question is, the servant of Isaiah 53 is innocent. The nation of Israel or any nation, for that matter, is far from innocent. Because all mankind have sinned. We're all guilty. All of us inherit our sin nature from our father, who inherited it from his father, from his father, his father, his, all the way up to Adam. The curse in the garden, the fall, is a curse that happens and is handed to all mankind. So that includes Jews and Gentiles. And so in Isaiah 53, the servant is innocent. Um, Let's see here. He says in verse 8, By oppression and judgment he was taken away as for his generation who considered... Um, he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my, uh, my, my people. Sorry. Um, he was afflicted. Here it is. Verse 7. As he, he was oppressed, yet he, and, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that it's, before its shears is silent, yet he opened not his mouth. Verse 9. And they made his grave with the wicked and a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. No violence, no deceit. The servant. If this is talking about the Jewish people, then it would be saying that there, none of them are violent ever and none of them have deceit in their mouth. Ever. Well, the problem is all of us are violent and all of us have deceit in our mouth because we're all inherited our sin nature. Does that make sense? So I'm trying to show, what am I doing here? I'm trying to show how the view that this is, the servant is specifically the Jewish people as a whole is not a correct view. Another one um, is in verse 8. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who consider that he was cut off out of the land of the living? What does that mean, cut off out of the land of the living? He was killed. There is one nation as a whole that still exists today that existed during the time Isaiah was written, and that is the Jewish nation. So we can't be referring to the Jewish nation because they're still here. Another, so there's three reasons why I don't think that the <coughs> Jewish interpretation of this Jewish passage, which is it's talking about the Jewish people as a whole, is a Correct interpretation. Why? Because it's singular. He, 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 him. Because they're not innocent. There is deceit because they're human beings just like me. And the servant's going to be cut off out of the land of the living. They have not been killed. That's the nation that still exists. So that's why I would say no, the Jewish interpretation of this passage is not accurate. Um, It's talking about a singular person who we learn 700 years later is Jesus of Nazareth. Amen? Amen. Okay, thank you. All right, let's go to 
Now let's talk about Isaiah's vantage point. The next, the next point in this overview. Isaiah's vantage point. And um, the vantage point explains why all of the verbs in Isaiah 53, 2 through 10, are in the past tense. That's what I want you to pay attention to. We're going to read this again. It's, it's incredible. Again, this shows us that it's the Spirit of God that, it's the, that is the author through uh, the man, Isaiah. It's the Spirit guiding Isaiah. The Spirit's the author. The tool in which the author has chosen to write this book, the tool is the person, Isaiah. But notice how this was written, if you think about a timeline, if the pulpit's the cross, this was written in the Old Testament, and then we go 700 years, we get to the cross. But Isaiah writes this as if he is on this side of the cross, looks back at the cross, and writes it from the past tense, like it already happened. Does that make sense? Okay. So notice the past tense. Notice he says in verse 2, he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had, past tense, no form or majesty. Verse 3, he was, that's past tense. He's looking back at the cross and saying, he was despised and rejected by men and men of sorrows, acquainted with grief and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was, I missed that one, despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has, past tense. It's not, he's going to uh, bear our griefs. Isaiah's writing it as if it already happened, as if he was looking from the New Testament time, looking back at the cross. Why is that important? Again, it gives us additional evidence that it's the Spirit of God through Isaiah. Number one, that's the author who knows the end from the beginning. Number two, that it's certain it's going to happen from Isaiah's standpoint because it's written in the past tense. It helps to drive home the fact this is certain guaranteed this is what's coming what's crazy is the jews missed it they had this chapter but they didn't think the messiah was going to come and be killed they thought the messiah was going to come and kill rome and rescue the jewish people out but the messiah came and kills sin and death by dying himself amen okay so the vantage point of isaiah the last one that we're going to talk about is this view of the substitutionary atonement. This theme of the substitutionary atonement of Christ. What does substitutionary atonement mean? We know what a substitute is, right? What's a substitute? That's right. So you step into the place of another. Substitute teacher steps into the place of another teacher because they're sick or absent. Atonement means to make amends, to reconcile, to make reparation, or to pay a debt. So this picture then of substitutionary atonement is a substitute paying the debt for someone else. Amen? Okay. So this is a theme that we see elsewhere in the Old Testament of this idea of the substitutionary atonement. So what this substitutionary atonement of the servant is saying is means that the Messiah was to suffer and die as a substitute for redeemed sinners. He essentially, he atones for their sins. He steps in their place and pays the debt for their sin. He takes the punishment, the guilt, the shame, the wrath of God that we deserve for our sin. He substitutionary atones for us. He steps into our place. I deserve what happened on Calvary. I deserve to be separated from God because of my sin. But my substitute atones for me on the cross where he says he takes the wrath of God for my sins. So we see this idea, this theme of a substitute dying to atone for sin elsewhere in the Old Testament. The first one is in Genesis. The idea of a substitute dying to cover sins of people can be traced all the way back to Genesis. That's what we're going to see. So after Adam and Eve ate the fruit to cover their sinful nakedness, what happens? They, 
take the fig leaves and try to cover their nakedness, right? They try to, by their own effort, atone and cover their shame, right? It's not sufficient. God has to do something. Well, what does he do? Verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Well, where did he get the skins from? The skin tree? The skin tree? He didn't get the skins from a skin tree, right? He got the skins from an animal sacrifice. So an animal, here's this substitutionary atonement theme popping up here. An animal had to die to provide the skins to cover the shame of sin. That's very important because that's the, that's the seed that this idea of a substitutionary atonement will grow. We also see it in the Leviticus 11 passage where God sets up um, this sacrificial system that the shedding of blood in the Old Testament sacrificial system was ordained by God to point forward to the time where His Son would be the sacrifice. But notice that there was death and blood for the atonement of sins. 17.11 of Leviticus. For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement, right? To make atonement for yourselves on the altar, it is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. So you see the theme of substitutionary atonement. Isaiah 53 tells us the final substitutionary atonement, the all-sufficient, the only one we need, is going to come in 700 years, and it's going to happen on the cross where the perfect, sinless, spotless Son of God will be the Lamb that is sacrificed, whose blood will be shed to atone, to pay the debt, to atone for the sins of His people, the people that put their trust and faith in Him. Amen? Amen. 700 years before it happens. So this theme of substitutionary atonement is all over. Um, the scriptures and brings forward in Isaiah 53 the fulfillment of that substitutionary atonement is going to happen at the cross in 700 years. Okay, next week we are going to look at the first section, dig a little bit deeper into the first section here and look at the exaltation of the servant. So we'll look at Isaiah 52, 13, 14, and 15. Cool? All right, let me pray. Father, I pray that even just today that the Holy Spirit would have opened eyes and hearts in this room to see who Christ truly is and that He is who He says He is. It's true. And that we have hope in Him and that He has paid the debt for our sin. He suffered the wrath that we deserve. I pray that these truths would open our hearts and eyes and cause us to obey Him, to walk in obedience to our King. I pray that that's the work that you do as we continue through this chapter over the next five weeks. Lord, we love you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.